Okay, it's time for some physics. Let's talk about the relationship between pressure, resistance, and flow. Now, there's gonna be some math here. I will not ask you to solve these equations, but seeing how they're related in a mathematical way can sometimes help. So, let's start with this. Flow, this symbol is, is proportional to. Think of it like an equals. It is proportional to the difference in pressure between two locations divided by the resistance. Let's talk about each of these. First of all, let's talk about pressure. Pressure is effectively just force exerted by this fluid on the walls of its container, or force exerted on the fluid. So what I want you to imagine is if I've got a tube here, let's say I'm applying a pressure of 200 millimeters of mercury to this side of the tube, to a fluid in this tube and then 100 millimeters of mercury to that side of the tube. Um, let me take a moment here just to explain what millimeters of mercury is as a unit. Let's imagine starting with a box with, filled with the liquid metal mercury and a glass tube um, with an open end down in the mercury and closed at the top. Now, keep in mind that we've got atmospheric pressure pushing down on the surface of the mercury but we're going to make sure that the glass tube is a, has a vacuum in it, so there's no pressure inside the tube. So atmospheric pressure outside, but zero pressure inside. In that case, the atmospheric pressure will push down on the mercury outside. There's nothing pushing it down on the inside, so it'll rise up in the tube. Now, what people found when they did this a while back is that if you make that tube close to a full vacuum, the Earth's atmosphere will push down on that mercury enough to push a column of mercury about 760 millimeters tall up into that tube, which is why we can refer to a pressure of one atmosphere as being equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury, at least at sea level. Okay, now, what's going, which way is the fluid going to flow in this case? If I'm applying more pressure on this side than on this side, which way do you think it'll go? Fluids move from where there's high pressure to where there's low pressure. So in this case, flow will be in this direction. Now the difference in pressure, delta P here, is going to be the difference from one side to the other. But let's take a look, let's compare this to another situation. What about a situation in which I have an identical tube and identical fluid in it, but on this side I have a pressure of 100 and on this side I have a pressure of 50. First, you can see already which way is the fluid going to go from high to low pressure. So it's going to go this way. The question is, which of these tubes, remember they're identical tubes, will have more flow? It's easy to think that it's going to be the same because we're using, recently we've been talking about ratios. We look at this and say, well, this is twice as much pressure and this is twice as much pressure. In these cases, however, it's actually the difference in pressure, delta P. So here, delta P is 100, the difference between the sides. Here, delta P is 50. This one has a bigger pressure difference, so this one will actually have more flow than this one, twice as much, all else being equal. So that's what delta P is, the idea of a pressure difference between two locations that makes the fluid flow. But what about this other thing, R, resistance? I'm going to give you another equation here, but don't be scared by it. I'll explain it in a moment. Resistance, R, is proportional to the length of the tube times this letter eta, which is a symbol for viscosity, the thickness of the fluid, divided by the radius of the tube, raised to the fourth power. So let's take a moment to talk about this using one of my personal favorite examples, milkshakes. So here we have an example of a person sucking on a delicious milkshake. Now, 
let's talk about what's going to affect how quickly that person can move the milkshake into their mouth. Actually, let's talk for a moment about how sucking up a milkshake works. So here's a straw in a milkshake. If I'm going to suck on the milkshake, first of all, we have to figure out what does, what does it mean to suck? If I suck on a milkshake, I'm sealing my lips around that straw and then expanding my lungs. By expanding my lungs, I'm lowering the air pressure in the milkshake. Before, the pressure in the straw is equal to the pressure in the straw pushing down on that milkshake here is equal to the atmospheric pressure out here pushing down on the milkshake. So if I've got pressure outside pushing down, pressure in the straw pushing down, and they're equal, the milkshake's not going to go anywhere. But if I expand my lungs, lowering the pressure inside the straw, so it's less than the pressure out here. Now I've got pressure outside pushing down on the surface of the milkshake, and a lower pressure in the straw. This is the straw. Which way is the milkshake going to go? Yep. The air pressure outside is going to push it up. So when I suck on a straw, what I'm actually doing is letting the Earth's atmosphere pushing down on that milkshake push it up into my straw and into my mouth, where it will be received with great delight if it's a good milkshake. Back to this. So what's going to determine how quickly milkshake flows through this straw? How much milkshake does this poor individual manage to get? And how can they maximize that? Well, let's think about the resistance to flow. First of all, we could talk about pressure. The harder I suck, the bigger of a pressure difference I make, the more flow I will get, all else being equal. Greater pressure difference means greater flow. But we also have to think about the resistance to flow. I imagine two cases in which you're sucking on a milkshake. In one, the straw is this long, and in the other, it's this long. Which one will get better? Which one will you get more milkshake through? The shorter one should work better because effectively, the longer the straw, the more, f more or less friction there is between the milkshake and the walls of the straw. Even if it's not sucking up a long straw, even if it's along horizontally, so pulling against gravity isn't an issue, it's still harder to suck through a long tube because there's more friction, more resistance. So greater length of tube means greater resistance. Greater resistance means lower flow. Here's, the other, here's another one. This weird thing here, the Greek letter eta, which stands for viscosity. Label that. So length times viscosity over radius to the fourth power. Viscosity is the thickness of the liquid. So honey is thicker than water. It move, It's more resistant to flow. It doesn't splash the same way. Uh, blood is also more viscous than water. Some liquids are less viscous than water. Milkshakes are pretty viscous. Now, if you imagine sucking on a really thick milkshake versus a watery milkshake, which one are you going to more is you going to get more flow with for the same amount of sucking pressure? Definitely the thin one. The thicker milkshake has higher viscosity. Higher viscosity means higher resistance. Higher resistance means lower flow. Now let's look at the, the last term, radius. Imagine two situations, two cups, same milkshake, same length of straw, but in one case, it's a coffee stirrer, and in the other case, it's a nice big straw. Which one will you get more milkshake flowing through for the same amount of sucking pressure? Definitely the bigger straw. Radius, the width of the straw, has a huge effect on this. Higher radius, bigger number here, means lower resistance. Notice it's on the denominator. Lower resistance means more flow. But it's even more than that. Changes in radius end up being very, very important. Any change you make in the radius, the way the physics works out, you raise that change to the fourth power. So in other words, if I double the radius, the effect on resistance is 2 to the fourth power, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 16. Doubling the radius reduces the resistance by a factor of 16, which will increase the flow by a factor of 16. So changes in radius make a big, big difference to flow. 
Interestingly, last I heard, don't quote me on this, although I guess this is being recorded, so it's inherently quoted. There was some research that indicated that traffic flow actually worked kind of like fluid flow, such that if you, ch if you change aspects of a roadway, you change the flow of traffic in a way similar to how fluid flow changes. And that actually makes this make a little bit of sense. If I make the freeway longer, then that kind of affects traffic in a way. There's more chances for things to go wrong, but the effect is not huge. Viscosity would be a little bit like adding more cars. And adding more cars certainly affects the flow of traffic. But radius changes also make a big difference. Have you ever noticed that if you've got something like an eight-lane freeway and you close down one lane, sometimes all hell breaks loose? That's kind of analogous to a small change in radius that suddenly makes everything a lot harder. So maybe you can think of blood flow that same way with the, in terms of these physics. So last bit on this. Let's talk about how this affects actual blood flow. If I am curious about how to affect the flow of blood to some particular place in my body. So let's imagine we've got our heart here. Looks like a pineapple. So here's my blood flowing out and I'm going to divert this into two directions. This is going toward location A and this is going toward location B. If I want to increase the flow to location A how could, but not to location B, just to A. How can I do that? Let's see, what will affect flow? Pressure differences. If I have a way of making the pressure difference to A different than B, that could do it. But the heart is applying the same pressure to both of these branches. So that's not probably not going to work. These will both see more or less the same pressure. So I'm left with how can I affect the resistance to flow? So if I want to increase the flow to A, I need to lower the resistance. Well. I could make the length shorter, that would lower the resistance, but that's difficult to do. Or I could make the length to be longer, but also difficult to do. Growing new blood vessels takes a while. The viscosity of blood largely comes from the number of red cells and the amount of protein in it. And I don't have any easy way of changing that for one of these branches or the other. That would, those effects generally would apply throughout the entire blood flow system. But radius I can change. If I want to increase the flow to location A, but not B, there are two things I could do. If I dilated the vessel to A slightly, I've increased the radius, which lowers the resistance, which increases the flow by a lot. Like we said, if I doubled that radius, flow would increase by 16 times. Or I could constrict the vessels going to B, which would increase the resistance there, making it harder for blood to go that way, which would tend to divert it toward A. So changes in radius are relatively easy for our body to do. All I have to do is put a little smooth muscle around those vessels, and then I can control each one individually, which will regulate where the blood goes. Nicely, those changes in radius are also the most effective way of doing it. So that's the main way our body affects blood flow. We apply pressure with the heart and with arteries, we'll get to that. And then we adjust flow to individual places, mostly based on differences in radius by dilating or constricting certain vessels.